Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 318. That's 318. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing. How am I? Ooh, I'm feeling a little bit warm. I'm feeling a little bit humid. I think, you know, like I'm perspiring all over my body, which I am. My forearms are a bit sweaty, um, mostly because I've, you know, been doing push-ups and sit-ups in my home, trying to turn my home into a home gym, which isn't really working to that that well. And I've got a brum plan, which I'm really looking forward to, not. So maybe all those kind of fears and worries are playing a factor in the fact that my body is leaking. But, you know, it is what it is. Apart from that, I'm feeling good, feeling fresh, man. Had a little bit of a, what, 24-hour fast, right, from yesterday about that. Ended up sleeping on an empty stomach, which is always good for the the overall immune system. I hope so. Um, as you can tell, my allergies that might not be such that might not be uh true at the moment. Which um no, I don't think allergies have anything to do with your immune system. But hey, um, allergies are kind of flaring up as they are previously. Um, I try and you know put off my running to the evening, which helps my allergies. But still, you can't really run away from those kind of things. So you know, spare a thought for your boy. Spare a thought for your boy if you don't mind. Um, yeah. But apart from that, everything is going as it to be expected. Lockdown continues. We are where we are we're doing things that we want to do and it is what it is what can you do i was just thinking right today about like a couple of things i miss or the couple of things i'm looking forward to do actually once everything gets back up and running and um you know there's the standard things about being in bars and clubs and going out and seeing your friends and things but i'm just thinking about actual moments right and i kind of jacked the idea from irish your fierce podcast so definitely check that out irish your fierce skeptic tank where he kind of asks a few of his comedian friends the five things they're looking forward to once everything gets you know uh settled down and everything's open back up again and part of the thing, and one of the things that I was thinking about, right, that I absolutely miss, um, like, you know, the actual moment, the actual situational aspect of it is the idea of walking up to a club, right? Whether it's a really popular club like the Bird Kind or Fold, or whether it's something underground or something that, you know, your friends are throwing or warehouse event. The actual walk to the event is what I miss the most, right? Like walking to the place, um, crossing paths with somebody that you don't know but they happen to be going there um having that moment where you're trying to decide whether or not you should speak to them or not um maybe 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 they speak to you and you have like a little bit of a cordial kind of chit chat before you go to the venue walking up there up to the gate and then seeing somebody you recognize on the other side of the gate having that really crazy moment like hey what's up man what no, 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 no. shooting the shit through the gate being all excited uh you know get your drinks ready uh, getting anything else that you have with yourself ready as well like all that good shit is what i miss those little moments like that right um other moments could be like when you're throwing on, when you're throwing your own party right when you're when you promote a club night in a club uh, in a nightclub or in a bar and then you have that moment when the rave is finished and it's just you you know the promoter maybe a couple of friends that helped you out and some of the djs that you booked maybe some close friends and family hanging around after the event's finished maybe getting some drinks from the bartenders who maybe had a good relationship with you because they you know they enjoyed the night the man just looking at your ass because you made them loads of money that whole moment is really fun man just hanging around that kind of vibe when everything's kind of like settled down and you're kind of figuring out to do an afters whether or not you should go home go to something else like it's just crazy i, I enjoyed that and then I'd, I'd say um having to navigate through a really busy cocktail bar that's another thing like navigate towards the bar or towards the table where your friends are at that's something that i miss like you know the ambience the smells uh the outfits the makeup the shoes the clothes just i love to kind of like absorb all that shit and take it all in the people behind the bar the different personalities you know bartenders have that kind of sixth sense of knowing kind of where everyone is they have really good spatial awareness i'm assuming because you know you're in a bar you're having to carry flipping uh, a whole plateau of drinks so you're kind of aware of what's going on they kind of clock you you maybe kind of give a nod to the guy behind the bar a little quick one you keep on going maybe the girl you kind of give a high five because you know from somewhere else you find your group of friends you have a little chit chat you you gather around you check if anyone's got a drink first if you have, you, you sorry you go around a circle and you double check if anyone needs a drink and you go and get some uh being at the bar taking out your car and having a little chit chat with somebody at the, at the bar just sitting there like yeah what's going on this place is mad da, 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 da. oh that moment is so beautiful but you know alas that will not come for a long time to come i think and those situations are going to be few and far between you know 
unfortunately. But hey, um, hopefully once it does come back around, there will be a sense of appreciation, I think. I think for most of us, we're going to have that, innit? We should have a little sense of appreciation, like, Jesus, man, look at the stuff that we missed out on. Look at the stuff we didn't take for, we took for granted, I'll say. I think that's something I'm going to have. And I expect to take yourself for granted. The, being outdoors and being in a park, I'm not going to lie. Like I said the other day, I'm getting annoyed with all these kind of, you know, part-time fucking runner wankers, right? That suddenly decided they've turned into fucking, you know, uh, Mo Farah. That's annoying. Um, and also the people that have suddenly turned into like these kind of outdoor activists, right? Like, oh, I have to be outside. I need to get some fresh air. I can't be indoors. It's like, get out of here. When when we were allowed to go outside as we please, none of you guys were going outside that often anyway. You were doing you were doing what everyone else was doing and going to nightclubs and bars like, you know, like the rest of humanity. Getting on that fucking train to Liverpool Street Station and, you know, and enjoying yourself there. No one went out in parks. And all of a sudden, everyone wants to be around greenery, right? Around the trees. And the, like, fuck off. And for sure, most of those parks, especially the ones we have in London, they're full of piss and caca anyway. It's not as if you're going to some, you know, utopia. It's not bloody, it's not the Garden of Eden, is it? It's far cry from the Garden of Eden. I'll tell you that for much for sure. But hey, what do I know? Anyway, loads of stuff to get into. Loads of interesting topics that I've got here listed from the interwebs as per usual. If it's your first time listening to the show and you like what you hear, why not smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below, let me know your thoughts. If you're listening to the podcast app, of course, why not? Leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends because you know what? You helping spread the show, gets it out there to more people, makes me richer, allows me to get a haircut, maybe some new glasses and potentially sort out my sinus issues. <laughs> oh shit but anyway let's get into this i've got a glass of little whisk here you know so cheers to you it's it's it's, it's midday why not have a little sippy the drinking thing has been interesting too right i think i've last this is probably the longest a bottle of whiskey has lasted me in a long time i've got about that much left and i've had it for what like about two weeks i think um Take a little bit here and there, right? During the evenings when you feel as if, like, you know, uh, life cannot go on any longer. Um, maybe during a session of a little bit of DJing indoors, you might have a little glass, you know, to keep you, keep you a little bit of a pep in your step. But that's been something I've realised has been an issue, I think, for most people when it comes to get lockdown. Like, my drinking has definitely increased. I, I don't drink as much every day, but I do drink a lot. I do drink little sips here most of the days in a week which adds up to a lot at the end of the week, isn't it? Whereas beforehand, when, you know, we were able to live our normal lives, you'd go to work nine to five. There's not really a time to drink Monday to f Thursday, Monday to Friday, unless you've got like a team bonding thing. So you end up drinking on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Those are your options that are available to you. And depending on if you have money because you spent money on travel and you just broke for the month, whatever, there's little, there's always these constraints that are in place that kind of uh, allow you to drink or allow you to not drink. But I've noticed because we're all indoors and we all have, loads of disposable income because we're getting furloughed or we're getting paid um, for, for to work at home. Essentially, we're not moving anywhere. We're cooking everything at home. You've got loads of disposable income so that when it comes to drinking, you're more susceptible and more willing to like throw your £27, your £24 here and there for a bottle of whiskey. And then because it's, you know, you don't want to have a hangover every day, you're having little sips, which means you have like a whole bevy of liquor in your cupboard that you can hold on to. And, you know, I would love to have a little bit more drinks actually in my home, but I know for sure Number one, I don't have the, the room for it. I would actually have. I actually like to have a little bar. I don't actually have the room for that. And number two, as well, I don't want to get into a habit of always having drinks available. But for sure, this has been the longest time I've had one bottle of whiskey around the home, just because you know there's nothing else to do really. So uh, I feel that. But hey, what can you do? So if you're in that situation, don't feel bad about it. Innit? We're all going through that as well, my friends. So number one situation I'm going to talk about here. Sorry, my nose is really, really runny at the moment. These allergies are playing absolute games on me. Bear with me one second whilst I decide to blow this. This is the main reason why I try my best not to go out running in the morning. Or I try and go out running before sunset, before, yes, sunrise and try and go running uh when it's sunset or after sunset because my allergies tend to like not flare up as much in the evenings but it's annoying because then you end up going to bed really knackered and tight and tense and shit so you know double-edged sword what can you do so 
moving on in, I thought I'd talk about quickly um, this video of the Cybertruck featured on Jay Leno's show, which is going to be previewed, I think, tomorrow, Wednesday, that is, right? Um, it's just fantastic to see the Cybertruck in real life, I think. That's maybe... Let's take a good drive. Way to speak about Don't this. mind me, I'm just Oops. driving Elon Musk around in Tesla's new Cybertruck. Come on! Oh, <laughs> got two windows open, I think, at the moment. So, yeah, this is Jay Leno talking about the Cybertruck um, on his program. And we get some really rare insight. Well, we get some really rare views of what it looks like on the interior because we didn't get to see all those pictures. I think some people that were at the event might have took some interior pictures. I didn't see many flowing around. Um, we still haven't seen a lot of the kind of truck bed itself, right? Because at the back, there's sort of like a bit where you can put stuff in it, like a pickup truck. We haven't seen much of that detail. I think someone mentioned that um, there's rules or regulations around having uh, wing mirrors as well. So they're going to have to install those maybe sooner or later. There might be some adjustments they're making size, which you mentioned in terms of fitting into regular garages but by the by it's just incredible to see this car in the wild because i think the beauty of us uh, the beauty of what uh, elon musk is doing with tesla or the beauty of what he's doing with spacex in general is that he's somehow been able to take this because i because i remember when i was studying product design at central St. martins right part of the reason why i went to that course or part of the reason why I applied is um, because I used to watch this, um, oh, what they fucking called? See, I used to watch this TV show on Channel 4 called, with a, it was a documentary sort of like TV series based around this design consultancy called Seymour and Powell. And they used to, they made like some really amazing products. They did some stuff with Dyson. They did some amazing airplane seats, like really crazy, amazing industrial design studio. And it got me inspired to do that kind of thing. But I also liked the aspect of like, you know, specking up these concepts. But part of the reason why I got a bit disillusioned with the industry because usually they'd kind of have a, you know, they'd have a client like Boeing coming could want to basically redesign the seats for their new plane and it go it it go from like iteration the iteration of the initial concept would go for this amazing really futuristic looking chair that was ergonomic and made out of one piece material was manufactured in a certain way used these really amazing bio uh, biodegradable materials really all these really crazy advances but then by the time it came to production it looked like a regular chair because they had to make so many adjustments in terms of making it cost effective and it just you know they the entire bureaucracy of getting stuff produced at a mass level required them to take away some of the fun and some of the uh, juice that came from the initial concept design. And I think that's what Elon Musk has done really well with Tesla. He's somehow been able to take the idea of concept cars and make them production ready, right? So the stuff that you see presented on the showroom, the stuff you see presented during a, you know, uh, a conference or during some kind of showcase is stuff that you're going to be able to buy yourself with your own hard earned money. And that's something that you never ever see from most car manufacturers. It's always just these amazing car uh, concept shows, um, these amazing car concepts showing that these car shows that you can't necessarily get your hands on, but they are going to take certain elements of the technology in that car and apply it to the manufacturing model, whether it's the lights or the seating or the way the engine starts. But the actual form factor of the car is completely changed. And it goes completely mundane. And I think he speaks about it a little bit here in this clip, but it's really incredible to see it. Let's take it for a drive. Don't mind me, I'm just driving Elon Musk around in Tesla's new Cybertruck. Uh, this job is the worst, isn't it? I mean, it feels very much like any other Tesla. You've got instant acceleration. The greenhouse is fabulous. I yeah. love how open it appears to be. And how close is this to what it looks look like? Look how beastly that looks when it comes out of the driveway. It just looks insane. And the funny thing about this car, I think someone mentioned in the comments that it's probably the same sort of like, um bed size or the same sort of overall dimension to like a Ford F-150 so it's big don't get me wrong but it looks gargantuan like it's just so interesting what you can do with proportions and you know uh, lines and shapes in order to make something appear bigger and more intimidating than what it, than its predecessor even though it has the same dimensions on paper it's just incredible 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 what they've done in production at tesla we always want to have the production car be better than the show car it, like it always drove me crazy when like, manufacturers would show, come out with this cool looking show car and then the actual production car would be way worse right, uh, right. and you're like man you got us all excited about this sweet looking car and then the production one is not it's terrible we won't do show cars that aren't real so i think we got the proportions here are pretty close. What would you change on when it finally reaches production? What do you think you would do? We're five percent too big, and if we just take all the proportions and drop that them by about five percent, oh, all the way around. Beautiful. Yeah, so it's got to fit in a normal garage. Right. Yeah. And the, the only problem I have with the, the Cybertruck is that I think because of the base color and because of the fact that you know it's made out of stainless steel, and um, 
it's got that kind of raw stainless steel finish. I think it's going to drive a lot of people to kind of, you know, wrap it in certain things. And it's going to just turn it into an absolutely ugly piece of, um, you know, just an ugly car. Some of the wraps people are going to do with it. You already see what people do with, you know, regular uh, regular luxury vehicles. Um, that's the only thing I'm going to think about. it. But I'm also assuming there's going to be companies coming out of the woodworks that are going to be specifically geared towards uh, customizing and updating the form factor of the Cybertruck in a really uh, in a really kind of I don't know stylistic way in a, in a way that has some kind of level of taste right there's probably someone's going to do that and imagine what's that company that does the Range Rovers the Range Rover Sports that all the footballers drive I can imagine them do something quite interesting with that right by initially maybe adding some side skirts and making you know lowering the profile maybe updating the rims as well but it just looks incredible. I love everything like, about this car. There's lots of little details so that uh, people wouldn't necessarily pick up consciously, just improving visibility. H having the glass like this is, right. is actually quite hard because it's so sloped. Is that a special kind of glass? Is that different oh, yeah. well, than normal windshield glass? Um, we are going to be using um, effectively uh, a form of arm armored glass right. for the car. And the door panels of the car are the 300 series stainless steel, and it's so tough that it's bulletproof to a handgun. Wow, and and wow, why wow. is that important to you that it be bulletproof? I mean, I don't... It's badass and yeah, well, yeah, okay. super cool. That's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I like I mean, that great answer. answer. Good answer. Do you want your truck to be bulletproof or not? Yeah, I guess, sure, I, 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 guess I want my truck to be bulletproof. Yeah, sure. exa exactly. You know, exactly. so cool man like honestly and it and you know what this part of it as well that kind of makes me really envy or really kind of admire elon is the fact that this car is he somehow because you have to if you remember the kind of you know the history of electronic electric cars you'll know that i forgot there was a british company that did electric cars too that kind of you know fell by the wayside but by the by they've kind of been especially from you know gearheads or pistol heads however you kind of refer them to uh that you refer to them as there is this kind of, you know, they weren't necessarily ref looked at as cool things. And I don't know how he's achieved it. I think that might be something for a book, maybe up and coming. How kind of Tesla was able to not only change the public sentiment towards electric cars, but also that cool factor, which is probably more important than you'd like to think it is. The idea that it's cool to actually drive a Tesla. The, the fact that they've made it somehow an aspirational item, obviously a luxury item due to its price range and due to the fact that, you know, the leasing options are quite limited and whatever it may be. But there's this idea that for even for me personally, I don't drive, I don't have a license, but in my mind, I have a goal of when I do get my first car, it's obviously going to be something really cool, like a really, you know, like a 90s or early 2000s, um, you know, sports car from back in the day that my dad used to drive, like, you know, like a Peugeot 205 GTR or something. But once, I get you know a bit stable in my life one of my main goals is to get a Tesla right a Tesla Model Y um, maybe the Roadster when it does eventually come out but I have that goal in my mind that okay when I start driving I'm going to get a Tesla I'm sure most there's a lot of people out there as well regardless of age and background who have the same sort of aspirations so that is a really big achievement he's able to do because you know there's going to be people out there who are going to choose you know electric cars over petrol cars just purely based on the economics of it or because they're you know um elon musk sycophants or because they love the ev community whatever but there's also that group of people out there like myself who are a bit you know numb plus and probably in the middle who look at it and think you know what that car's cool that guy is cool everything that company do is cool and i want to be associated with that cool brand i want that too as a marker to know that people know that i'm cool um i think that's really really um clever marketing from them at tesla and something that is very hard to achieve so i definitely would like to see a bit more um you know a bit more of an analytical look at exactly what happened there and how they're able to achieve it because that's in, it really really inspirational to see man but um i think this show's coming out on wednesday on cnbc i'm sure it's going to be uploaded on the youtube and stuff for people to watch later on but i thought that was a really interesting clip man really really cool next on the list we have uh, um, I wanted to give a shout out to Mark Norman actually. Um, Mark Norman is a, is a comedian who I listen to uh, quite regularly on the podcast and all that good stuff. And he's got his own um, comedy special out now at the moment called Out to Lunch. It's really, really funny. I watched it uh, what, a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's actually a trailer for it out now that I'm going to quickly play for you guys so you can hear it. And then I'll push you towards watching it yourself. HBO, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. Comedy Central, Pornhub, and BET. He passed on all of them. 
because he hates money. And they said no first. I think I'm autistic, but just like the bad parts of it, you know? Like I can't compute numbers or remember dates, but I'll make you feel weird. <laughs> I just watched a documentary on pedophilia with my friend. My friend goes, oof, I could never have sex with a kid. They're so annoying. <laughs> I was like, that's it, huh? We hate to admit it, we've come a long way. Like in the 50s, we had whites only and blacks only water fountains, which is incredibly sad, especially if you're a thirsty Asian. Mark Norman is giving his special to the people for free because he loves his fans and nobody would buy it. More people die in America of obesity than starvation, which is like, hey, we did it. <laughs> I know a girl, she's lactose intolerant, still producing milk. She's making something she can't even tolerate. I met a nice girl in that Jewish app. What's that Jewish app called? The Jewish one? Uh, PayPal. Yeah, yeah. Mark Norman, Out to Lunch, May 12th, on YouTube. Honestly, man, it's really, really funny. I really recommend you check it out. Um, it's interesting because um, comedy is in a really interesting space, especially stand-up specials. Um, because of this, you know, um, over... <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, allergies. Because of this um, over fetishization with identity politics and, you know, this weird. Oh, God almighty, man. Honestly, honestly, honestly. Taking these allergy tablets is the worst thing in the world. It seems like it kind of has a moment for like the first 20 minutes where it sort of like spikes your allergy um, symptoms. Then it kind of levels out. But hey, mama mia. Um, God bless summer, innit? I love summer. Not. Oh, God almighty. Okay, so comedy's in a weird place at the moment. <laughs> Due to um, identity politics and SJWs and all that sort of good stuff. So there's this weird, it feels like undercurrent where the industry is sort of like push gearing it, steering away from... <clears throat> oh God, I'm waiting. Sorry. It feels like the industry is steering away from promoting or kind of showcasing, you know, um, quote unquote, cis white males. And, you know, for maybe kind of uh, giving a platform to marginalized people who don't necessarily have a voice in Hollywood. <clears throat> oh, God. Jesus, honestly, I'm about to move on from this topic. This is a real allergy, a real allergy flare up. Oh, God. Don't know why, but hey, what can you do? So maybe it might be a time to actually move on. So uh, forgive me again if you were listening to this via the podcast app. I'm really, really apologise. The sneezing is probably very disconcerting. And if you're watching via the YouTube, of course, apologies for seeing any kind of burger residue all over my face. But anyway, as I was saying about Mark Norman. So Mark Norman is really funny, basically. Um, one of the more funnier guests that appear on that kind of, you know, LA comedy crew circuit, basically because he's a New York comedian. So he kind of tends to be a bit more jokey and less about the, you know, everything else outside of the jokes the image the branding the merch and shit it's all about the co the comedy bang 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 obviously the style as you've seen is very much based on you know the quintessential setup punchline um there isn't there there are some stories interweaved here and there but for the most part it's just him going on there and just kind of weaving together this narrative of these stories <laughs> that basically fit into his templates of how he does jokes. So really clean, really well done, very well produced. I like the fact that he put it onto YouTube. I think there should be more of a drive for comedians to do so. I know a lot of them kind of want to have the validation from the industry to have a special on the big network. I understand it. But I think now in the climate that we're in now, considering COVID and lockdown and considering the, you know, the um, the prevalence of podcasts within the communities, within the comedy circuit, it's only natural. It's only, it only makes sense for you to allow the same people that kind of consume your content for free on YouTube and these platforms of podcasts to still have the option to view some of your stand-up special on the internet as well for free. If they want to then pay for it later on on another platform, fair be uh, if you know you know if you, fair do if you want to do so. But they're, they're, I think you should be able to kind of close a loop in that regard and do it that way, especially one or two. I think you know comedians could probably go away with probably doing an hour special every two years maybe a couple of 30 minutes every year and maybe the 30 minute special you just throw up for free on the on the interweb so that would be a probably a pretty good way to go about doing things i think going forward but by the by again one of my favorite comedians um on the in, in the industry in the scene really really funny guy give him a follow if you haven't already and check out his standout special called out for lunch available now next on the list here we have holy shit this is amazing 
Oh, this is a really cool little gadget invention that Costa Coffee is run is rolling out. I guess in all their locations, um, uh, due to yeah, because they're reopening. I think in the UK. So this is a really clever idea. So essentially, you got this kind of little uh, video from Costa Coffee. It says our new drive-through shelves have been getting lots of love. Um, who's seen these in action? So when you go to the drive-through, they've got this little compartment that I'm assuming has a lever on the other end that they sort of kind of lower, and you can kind of bring the drinks closer to you and take them out yourself, which is great because you know most drive-through windows, some you no know, some drive-through windows are kind of at a weird height or they're a bit further away or no at a weird height or you can't actually get up close to them if you're in a car so it makes it a bit awkward and because of covid and you know because of covid and the pandemic you want to limit the amount of touch points you have with the customer so if you're able to somehow make or if you're somehow able to alleviate their fears by bringing their merchandise closer to them without you handing it to them that's going to be perfect and i think by like with a lot of things um with these, all these kind of innovations socially and um to do with technology and to do with infrastructure we're seeing you know uh, companies um You've seen companies favor working from home as opposed to working in the offices, which is then allowing them to look at the books and see how much money they're wasting on, you know, big, big room offices in the middle of central London that are maybe, you know, costing millions and millions of pounds every single year. They're kind of cutting back on that and maybe having a few satellites offices set up here and there for upper management and team meetings and stuff. I'm also thinking that these sort of innovations were inevitable, but they kind of been rushed because of COVID. They kind of been rushed forward because of COVID and the pandemic. It sort of has to kind of, you have to innovate in order to kind of get us back to some level of normality. But I think going forward, this is something that's going to have to be uh, uh, kept in place anyway regardless so it should be an issue and as well i think the idea of protecting the workers in some aspect too is really um important as well in these sort of service industry jobs but i'd like to see a lot more companies uh, adopt the same sort of tech whether it's you know uh, mcdonald's a burger king whatever fast food joint that you kind of go to have the same sort of options as well that'd be pretty cool to see um going forward but yeah a great little invention by costa i'd like to see how it kind of gets implemented i'm sure customers are happy with it too because you get your food you know quickly and easily there's aspects as well that you can I'm, there's kind of a part of me it's like you know when you get something handed to you for a drive through and you and they forget your ketchup but you have to look inside the bag to check it there might be an aspect where you can kind of you know as you get your thing from the as you're because there's a bit of a, a separation in between there's a sort of like mechanical arm it kind of allows you to not feel guilty for, re uh, for requesting something that you've probably missed out on like a bit of ketchup or you know a sauce that might have been included into your meal maybe that's something i'm not too sure but regardless i think it's really cool tech hopefully you see it with other um other fast food joints rolling up really really soon but yeah really interesting to see man i love it love it love it love it great innovation from costa costa oddly enough is much much more popular i feel like in the uk as opposed to starbucks overall maybe it's because you know they have their little kiosk and a little machine set up in like supermarkets right they have them in is it same and tesco's only same i'm not too sure but it feels as if i see more people carrying around custom mugs of coffee than i do them seeing you know carrying around starbucks cups starbucks you only ever see in like the kind of hipster um offices and stuff like in around liverpool street or shoreditch and whatever you don't necessarily see people with like you know actual ends where you might live carrying glass uh, little cups of starbucks or maybe it's because most of the people that do buy starbucks are you know prone to carrying around those little refillable cups i'm not too sure but i, I don't know i've got a feeling that's that's the case but maybe again maybe it's partly due because you know they've got their little kiosk set up in supermarkets that might mean that they are able to kind of you know touch a broader customer base i'm not too sure what do i know Anyway, moving on, moving on up, moving on in. Um, another innovation that's pushing uh, people closer to the future is cocktails to go in America, which is something that's quite perplexing, isn't it? When you go to America, you realize how weird it is that you can't exactly drink outside on the streets. Like you can't just grab a beer or, you know, grab a bottle of vodka and just be swinging it as you're walking down the street which is very bizarre considering the amount of nonsense they get up to in the states right the amount of absolute you know craziness that happens there on a day-to-day -day basis that somehow drinking on the street is you know a big worry for the police uh, but i guess in general that no one no police officer is going to write you up a ticket for drinking on the street you might get a warning but i guess no one wants to do the paperwork of taking you to jail you know i'd imagine so so it's probably something that's kind of um 
uh, you can kind of work around it. And I'm sure people do that, you know, that thing you see in movies all the time where they always have a paper bag around it, which is dumb because, you know, we all know what you're drinking if you've got a paper bag around your drink. You're not keeping it cool. You're just ensuring that no one sees that you're drinking a fucking white claw at nine in the morning. But this news comes from ESA. It says cocktails to go are now legal in Pennsylvania. It says uh, cocktails to go are now legal in Pennsylvania after legislation temporarily relaxing the state's strict liquor laws passed the state Senate last week and was signed into law by Governor Tom Wolf on Thursday. This major change for a state that only started to allow grocery stores to sell beer a few years ago is effectively immediately. Restaurants with the right permit can already sell beer, wine for takeout, which again, you know, is something that kind of came about because of COVID, a little silver lining. It's allowing some restaurants that probably couldn't get away with because I don't, but that, that's part of me that doesn't think. I'd imagine you have to sell a lot of alcohol to make it profitable. You know, um, I'd imagine you know COVID has probably halved or more than halved uh, liquor sales in restaurants um, in general. Because you know, if you have a full restaurant or people teaming, you know, all the energy that's going around, people getting waved, they probably um, have this weird effect of kind of. Uh, encouraging others to order more drinks maybe the ambience I don't know there's something in it being a restaurant will probably encourage people to drink more I assume if you're ordering a fucking burger to go from a really you know, well known restaurant you're probably not going to drink as much as if you were actually in the establishment that's the you know that probably goes without saying but the ability to add on a little bit of an add-on sale with the alcohol is probably something that they probably you know are not taking for granted at all if you're in a restaurant industry in America and again something that would probably had to have been you know implemented um, further down the line but again COVID is sort of like rush these fingers into effect it continues it says under the new law restaurants bars and hotels who hold an r or h liquor license lost more than 25 percent of their average monthly sales and also sell prepaid meals for takeout can sell mixed drinks to go in sealed containers for of at least four ounces and no more than 64 ounces of pickup only not delivery customers don't have to buy food when buying drinks which is bloody awesome to see um it feels like America is different to the UK. I think America has a lot. I've seen a lot more American people on Twitter complaining about washing their plates or having to make their own cocktails than I do see UK people. I think we're probably more used to the whole pre-drink culture and maybe, you know, I don't know, eating at home. I don't know. Is that is that a thing? Maybe I'm kind of um, interpreting it wrong, but I feel like the people that I follow on social are not complaining that much about it for the most part but you know the, again the opportunity to after a hard day's work at home to kind of have the ability to kind of go out stretch your legs pick up a little cocktail drink on your way back while I listen to a podcast or an album is probably much a good thing to do anyway and especially if you think about it going forward if we end up going living in a world where um, remote offices are the thing right where we're all working kind of um, from remote offices or working from home it probably is advantageous to put people to have these habits set in place or to have these procedures or to have these kind of um, protocols in place where you can go to a restaurant and pick up a cocktail without feeling like you have to sit down or obliged to eat something and keep it moving. Because I think that's a good thing, right? It's kind of rewiring people's brains to be able to kind of entertain yourself in that regard maybe a little bit to be to be able to kind of make those uh, things fun. Because there was a time when, you know, remember that Instagram account, uh, Table for One? And people were like, you know, kind of taking the piss out of people that went out and sort of like, you know, had something to eat on their own. Now more so than ever, I'd imagine if you especially living in a household, in a shared household, you'll probably will see a lot more people going out on their own once everyone out on their own when stuff opens up just so they can get away from their housemates. So it won't be that much of a taboo anymore. So maybe having these little maybe practicing these, you know, pickups and restaurants being able to, you know, figure out what kind of works and maybe having some after work specials, some payday specials, some Friday specials that are kind of geared towards that kind of worker is a great way to go about things. And maybe is going to be advantageous for an industry or the industry itself going forward isn't it who knows um the drinks must be mixed on the premises and must be combined uh must be a combo of spirits and mixers which means bars who want to sell a martini need to add a splash of olive juice to the gin and verma to stay within the letter of the law um it's interesting because this means that you know those guys selling uh nutcrackers in the state in new york that's going to be a legal thing now do you think nutcracker sales have gone up i wonder if they have Nutcrackers are like, um, I think they featured it on Vice once where they sort of like mix all these little fruit juices and different cheap uh, liquors into a punch, essentially, really colourful punches. And they usually freeze them and then bring them up, to, you know, and then put them in kind of, you know, uh, freeze boxes like Yeti boxes and shit and sling them at the, in the street corner or a basketball court, wherever kind of people are gathered around. And they get people super waved because um, obviously, you know, they don't necessarily measure the amount of alcohol they put in them. So imagine if, if Nutcrackers became like a thing. 
like moonshine, like local moonshine, people kind of setting up little uh, breweries or something, you know, or cocktail stands in there. I'm sure that's happening. I'm sure that's happening within little rural communities or just communities in general um, within the States. I'm pretty sure. Um, it says wine so continues here wine into go cups is not included in this and no cocktails made with wine either so sangria is off the table the thinking behind this is many restaurants and bars previously invested in an expanded wine permit allowing them to sell takeout wine and it would be uh, not be fair to let them everyone do it yeah so i like the idea behind it i think these it's going to be really, really cool to see the innovations behind it how they're going to package it the labeling um you know how they're going to market them the kind of shift in the idea that you know you can actually because that might be such a mind fuck with people in the states like legitimately being able to like you know carry a cute little bottle on your way home and have a nice little drink as you're kind of chatting to your friends on facetime and shit that must be a real mind shift so it's going to be take a lot of getting used to i imagine for some people but you know for the alcoholics out there they're probably going to be like yes but yeah, cool to see, man. News from Eater there. Check it out if you're that way inclined. Uh, next on the list here. Let's keep on rolling. Loads of topics to talk about. Da, 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 da. Actually, let's talk about this one. We're talking about social distancing and working from home, right? There's this really cool article that I saw about working from home from the BBC. Where is it? I can show you here before I continue. Da, 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 da. Where is it? 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 It should be here somewhere. Intimate. Yeah, there we go. So, um, will we ever go back to the office? Right. Everybody's doing it. Where is it coming from? Oh, where's that article? It's here somewhere. I had it listed here. Coronavirus. Where is it? That, was that the one? Yeah. What's the future? So let's copy that one. Let's get that down there. Da, 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 da. Okay. So this article is from the BBC, right? So what's the future of the office? Um, uh, What's the future for the office? I've been a stringent um supporter of remote wo working for a while i think having worked in the startup industry for most of my career um and worked in various kind of corporate companies too i've, I've worked in every company i've worked in a company from like i've been a 50th employee i've also been a 500th employee right i've worked in, in both scales and everything in between and i've noticed especially in the places that i've enjoyed the most places that have kind of aligned to my career goal places where i felt comfortable places where people were similar interests as mine and i've kind of aligned to the company goals and all that good stuff i've always felt as if like the open plan working space was very um um it wasn't constructive for for like focus hard work especially when it required you to maybe implement a product set up a service uh get a campaign running things that kind of required a lot of mental acumen and some kind of level of concentration don't lend themselves well to an office where you can essentially kind of look up and kind of see your work make shout over get their attention make them come over to you and spoil their work um kind of you know their workflow and also those people around you and you know knowing myself i'm a loud person when i once i get going it's hard to turn me off so you know you can just imagine what that must be like with people like myself in the office and, and people who are um, louder or more gregarious than i am it can be a complete kind of horror show so i've always thought that you know this kind of idea that you know open the cl classic kind of work first where you had like people segmented in different teams or you had people locked in offices was kind of you know got went by the by and was made to be uncool was really uh was really kind of a short side idea and this idea that somehow because we were open plan we we're going to collaborate it never really come to fruition any kind of company you've been at i'm sure you can kind of attest to it the idea that you're going to collaborate with your teammate because you can kind of look over your monitors and see them is preposterous right you've got people that you like and you have people you don't like in your office if you're not if you don't like them you don't like them you're not going to talk them so i think the coronavirus what is effectively done is uh is effective for especially people in management the people that actually kind of are the shot callers or not management because you know they're just uh glorified employees that kind of jack themselves off right but people that actually found companies and actually start them i think they've definitely realized once they look at the list of people's uh, list of employees and their output they've been able to kind of really focus in on the people that are actually pulling their weight 
and actually contributing large amounts or actually contributing some kind of effective um, strategies or whatever they're doing. They're making some big changes in the company and the people that aren't doing so well. So, right? so people that are pulling away, people that are not pulling away. It's really easy to see once people work from home because it kind of levels the playing field and allows people to see exactly who's doing the work and when because, you know, there are no distractions. Effectively, you have the quote-unquote privilege of being able to work from home. So there is a kind of a mutual... Ex at, there's a kind of mutual expectation that you should be given a bit more and if you are going to give a bit more it should be to a certain level because you know you've been given this kind of privilege but coronavirus has kind of put that aside that kind of you know weird sort of like um intrinsic uh guilt trip is sort of like been put to aside and just people are just able to just kind of just do their work and get on with it because there's only so much amount of wanking off and kind of you know getting distracted by youtube you can do once you're in lockdown because it gets a bit boring and actually doing your work is quite fun doing the best work you can do and being a family member of the team is quite beneficial for yourself for your career and those around you so i think it's made it's changed everything and i'm sure for the people that own these companies the soaring prices and rent especially in london that they're paying right to be because effectively offices are just offices are less so to are less to do with the actual employees and more to do with the board members and potential investors right especially in startup world you can't deny that you know having a work having the we work postcode somewhere in the middle of london is going to add some kind of level of cachet some kind of level of um you know luster and glitter to your name and to your reputation as a startup because other investors other vcs value we work too they have a place in the culture blah 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 right you know where that game kind of goes from but i think now what we're going to see is maybe an influx of more startups kind of launching and kind of coming out uh, from the reefer because they're going to feel as if like they finally got a chance to compete with companies because they're going to be given a fair crack of the whip regardless of where the offices are based because no one will have a quote-unquote head office they might have satellite offices or pure boxes where they kind of collect mail or places that they can collect meetings but the idea that you could walk into like a swanky you know um startup office with you know their kind of logo at the front and a pet dog that runs around the office that's going to be completely gone and i think that's a really great thing to see going forward i can't wait to see it. and kind of and this uh, article from the bbc echoes some of these thoughts that i've been speaking about let's quickly read through it so it says here, uh, before the coronavirus pandemic, the office was where millions of us spent about a third of our time. However, since lockdown, almost half the UK workforce say they've been working from home and some companies have hinted that it will become the future. Here's a quote. It says, the notion of putting 7,000 people in a building may be a thing of the part, said the boss of Barclays, while Morgan Stanley's chief said the bank will have much less real estate. Businessman Sir Mar Martin Sorrell said that they'd rather invest the 35 million he spent on expensive offices in people instead, which is insane to think that they were doing it anyway and thought it was a good idea. And it also goes to show just how uh, bandwagony and uh, copycat the business industry is. At the moment one person does something and it works, or the moment the industry kind of changes is tacked everyone follows suit and everyone kind of rabbits the same chorus the same kind of explanation money saving better for our workforce improving the coach it's all gobbledygook right they're only doing it, of course because of the pandemic but some of the more forward-thinking companies are already especially some of the people that have people that are actually operating on a high level or maybe roles that require people to concentrate for long periods of time would allow those key individuals to maybe work from home more so because there's there have been some companies where i've been had a more of a flexible working schedule maybe, maybe they'd maybe uh have a workforce that's predominantly made up of young parents and stuff where they maybe give them the option to work from home but mostly the companies i've worked for working from home has been seen like a privilege like if you get allowed to work from home it means you're a real teacher's pet it means you're a real bootlicker it means that you you know the kind of person that comes in at eight and leaves at 8 p.m right you've got no life your whole life kind of revolves around your work and what you do for your boss and your managers and shit which you know is by the by do what you want to do but you know i don't want to be friends with that kind of person but this culture shift now which allows everybody even the person that turns up exactly on time and leaves exactly on time is going to be great for the morale of the team in general and it's also going to be great because it's going to allow owners as well just to really identify who is actually making changes company who's actually pulling their weight and actually doing the work instead of kind of this idea that because you stay behind until 8 p.m it must mean you're hard worker no you might be doing jack shit you might be just talking with your friends or on your phone or kind of you know resharing uh nonsense articles on the feed it does it, anyway continues it says the game is up for the office as we know it, uh, suggests Bruce Daisy, uh, who is author of Joy of Work. It says, unfortunately, 
we might get misty eyed about it but i think the office is um in the form of it used to be it's probably now a thing of the past i was chatting to someone who works at a major media outlet last week and he said he used to have 1400 people coming into his office every day for the last eight weeks he had 30 people and the product hasn't changed he said anyone who thinks things are going to go back to the way they are is bananas which is definitely true just can't justify and of course that's a big bank right saying 53 million I don't, uh, uh, 35 million sorry i don't think most companies spend that but you have to imagine just by what you know take into effect try and think about the closest friend you have who lives in london who has a really nice apartment and think about what they pay and then think about what it must be like to rent uh, an office space somewhere in and <laughs> near that where that person lives it's just insane and then the pra you know and then internet and utility bills and all that shit like oh insane um it continues here it says um but the current end of the office is not clear cut says uh professor andre spicer from city university cast business school he predicts a radical decrease in the amount of time people spend in the office but says off office work will not be over for good one reason he suggests is that home workers uh tend to not get promoted as quickly as they tend to be overlooked and eh, that's not really that's true but if your whole workforce is working from home they're gonna have to implement some kind of procedures that can allow people to get promotions you know whether it's kind of quarterly reviews year reviews that give people an, an opportunity to kind of you know say their piece put their hat in a ring for an, uh, for a, a, uh, a vacancy that comes up maybe an inter maybe an internal hiring um system there's going to be things they're going to put in place but i don't think if everyone's working from home it's going to affect you because you're the only one that turns up to the office because there's a lot of people especially in the companies i've worked in if you have a work from home option the people that take the piss out of it the most are you usually the managers right your line manager is the one that you know they kind of sort off the most it's usually the underlings the kind of you know the employees or quote unquote the the people on the front line who actually have to kind of you know bite the bullet and come in most of the time during christmas and everyone's kind of fucking off they're the ones that really get um fucked up the ass with all that shit i don't really think it really affects the people that are actually at the top if you really think about it um so i don't think the idea they're gonna be able to promotion is gonna be a thing and also i think there's an aspect of if you are gonna work from home there's an opportunity for you to maybe change the way the office environment actually works you can still have an option you can still have the possibility of making it maybe mandatory or making it up or making it encouraged for people to come in uh you know at the end of the month for like a company all hands on a friday and then it turns a company all hands into a really joyous occasion because people are going to have the opportunity to see their friends again from the office right connect catch up about stuff that they spoke about on slack um they're going to be encouraged to maybe share things that they've been working on at home and they're going to want to show and tell like imagine how fun those things are going to be usually they're really annoying because you spend half you spend most of the week at work trying to get work done everyone's distracting you then when the all hands comes around you're like oh i don't have time to do the stuff that i was going to do and you're kind of um you're kind of annoyed that you're having to like you know sit around with your colleagues and listen to the manager talk about the goals of the company but if you actually have time to work at your at your craft do your job when it comes to the all hands you're going to be over the moon that you're going to have an opportunity to show off some of the work you've been doing behind the scenes you're going to love it um so it continues, it says here, particularly in times of economic crisis, people will start thinking, I want to be in your workplace. The boss needs to see me. Eh. Uh, again, it all, always has to come from a professor, isn't it? People that are not actually have skin in the game, who are not practitioners, people who are just kind of, you know, critics and commentators from the outside, always have these kind of reservations. But the people that are actually working in the industry, people that have actually have jobs in these startups who have worked in these corporate companies, you know that most of the times, especially if you're having to travel a far distance, you have to go to like, you know, the other side of London, you're having to pay for a travel cars to pass through certain zones or bus tickets or you're having to kind of you know have a 40 50 minute bike ride that requires you to change and shower when you get to work you're going to be over the moon that you have the opportunity to work primarily from home with the option to go to the office when need be uh, it continues it says uh professor spicer suggests offices will remain as hubs where senior management are, are based i don't agree because senior management have to take their piss and all go home all the time he says with employees shoveling in once a week to meet with their bosses that seems to be a similar to twitter's plan allowing staff to work from home forever it says here um, home working is not new it's been uh, upped in recent decades and many companies have already been trying to save money on rent by hiring co-working spaces that's not really a, a good idea though because co-working spaces are usually located in premium locations um, and they usually come with a lot of kind of added on benefits such as you know a fully stocked com communal area with tea and coffee and shit that always gets added onto your monthly rent you know utilities already set up um, plugs uh, chairs all that good shit is already built in so it's a kind of a tax you get added on 
into it and the fact that you've got a really advantageous postcode so the fact that you think you're going to be able to pay less there is really a misnomer you pay for the kind of uh, brand uh, uh, brand alignment right you want to be in a building surrounded by companies that are similar to yours like right those building i forgot there's a building in shortage like that where there's loads of financial kind of companies uh they're working in fintech companies right and they all kind of situate in the same building you kind of want that alignment so that's mostly what people do um, so see, um, how they affect us as many of us have already discovered some of the perks of the problems of working from home some are obvious no commute less chance to socialize with colleagues but others go to the heart of identity quote it says i think we should uh all how at well we're uh, how like what we're losing says lucy kellaway who has written a book about uh, fiction and non-fiction about offices i think the most important thing about office is it gives more it gives some sort of meaning to what we do most of what we do to our laptops let's face it, it's pretty much meaningless the best way of thinking there's uh, some point of it is having other people who are sitting around you yeah but i don't think that's a good idea i think if anything covid lockdown has taught us what's meaningful is your friends and family being able to touch feel feel hug uh speak to and hang around people that you care care about for real is what the world should be about more so all these kind of like fake surface level work friendships that you kind of cultivate because you have no one else to talk to or because you spend all your time in the office isn't healthy it's not good for your mental right you need to have that separation of being able to go into work uh, do your job and also go home and uh, connect with your family and friends and not feel like you know every kind of conversation you have with your family and friends revolves around the people that you work with that is not a life worth living i think this um, separation is going to be for the better it's going to increase and really Really, it's gonna really it's gonna really separate the friendships that you have and also kind of it's gonna bring you're gonna see the benefits of having work colleagues as friends when you meet them you know every week to do an all hands or to have like a company meeting or to do the stand up whatever it may be and you're gonna have the benefit of unplugging and pulling out and seeing your friends during the week and catching up with drinks i think those are two perfect things but the idea that you're somehow losing your identity because you're not connected to your friends is ridiculous you shouldn't your work shouldn't be your identity anyway your identity should be the things that you do for your friends and family in your community not the work that you do the money that you you know the money you made to kind of keep the lights on that's ridiculous there's only a certain group of people a small segment of the population that are maybe working in a vocation that they've kind of longed and loved to do since they were a kid fair enough but for the most part when most of us are working in companies or jobs that we could give a shit about but we do it because you know we want to be a, a valuable member of society we want to kind of contribute to the household bills we want to support our family keep a roof over our heads pay for our holidays all that good shit and companies are willing to kind of give that exchange right they give you money you give them time boom you keep it going uh, blah, blah, blah. so she adds here the office uh keeps us sane and gives us routine um and once there and once we're there we can be a different person i don't know about you but i'm mostly sick and tired of being the same person all day as i slouch around your home what the fuck is she talking about it's almost insane what are you why are you being a different person when you go to work anyway i've always hated that people that have different faces when they're at work be yourself if you can't be yourself at the place you're working at maybe go somewhere else right that's not a really that's not healthy that you're kind of turning into different people switching and turning that's a problem that you see a lot when people go to like when people have work drinks and somebody gets a little bit you know maybe someone gets a little bit handsy or they get a little bit aggressive or they get a little bit belligerent right because you don't necessarily see that side of them at work because they try and keep this professional oh, but, 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 face when they're at work all the time no be yourself and why would you have your identity framed around the thing that you do for nine to five as at work it doesn't make any sense um i wanted to have a different clothes go to the office see different people and who become a lifelong friends i have a couple of complete laugh with them i'm here but you can do that when you're at home too have a routine wake up at a certain time uh shower in the morning that's something i've been doing uh, and consistently um waking up in the morning listening to my audio book doing a bit of meditation showering in the morning changing into some comfortable clothes not not pajamas and not kind of going out clothes but comfortable clothes that you know i've made an effort to kind of get dressed do those things and you can also have that can also kind of give you some level of routine that you don't need to go to the office to do so um Oh, the only thing I think that's going to be really uh, detrimental to some people is this kind of social aspect of work. A lot of people generally don't have any friends. Like legitimately, the only friends they they, they collect over life, because it's hard to find, unless you have an interest, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Yeah, it's hard to find friends when you're, the, you know, over the age of maybe 21, right? It's just difficult to get new friends. So some people only collect friends once they're at work because you're kind of forced to get to know people because you're with them eight hours a day, 36 hours a week, right? It's, it's just something that kind of ha has to happen over a period of time. But I think it's going to, like I said, I think working from home is going to allow you to maybe value the actual friendships you have at work. And it's also going to allow you to actually value the people that you know 
outside of outside of your occupation i would imagine so but i'd imagine that's the one bit people are going to suffer from the idea of not having able to be able to chit chat and then maybe that might, that might be a real side indictment on work culture where the most thing the thing that you miss the most is the chats because you know this let's be honest I, i'm not a fan of nine to fives but you are working for somebody right they are paying you to go into the office and work for them the fact that you miss the social side of it is a really really bad indictment on yourself and the overall um idea of working in the office right the fact that the social side is something that you miss the most right the chats at the coffee machine about so and so it's just like that's nonsense it says here professor spicer says attitudes no studies show that people who work from home are more productive and happier especially without the commute and one of the big factors that make people unhappy but among the downsides she cites one study showing home workers feel that they are in exile yeah that's because it's before no Dude, these studies are only based on old again these this is what i mean about this is due to lockdown thing these studies are based on the old reality that we had the reality of pre of prior uh you know post um not post uh, prior to covid right now we're in post when well, now we're living in a post covid world it's different because we're all going to be working from home so this idea that you're missing out this idea that people are getting one up on you because they're turning up in the office at eight and leaving at eight, at eight p.m it's not going to be exist anymore because we're all working from home um, it continues uh, catching their boss's eye becomes their job and it's their desire to be seen as doing stuff and when you're not you become a bit worried and paranoid yeah that's a general working workplace thing but I think that's going to be replaced actual doers and actual practitioners are going to be rewarded more so than people that actually you know lick their asses and you know boot lickers and all those kind of things are going to be put by the wayside because your numbers and the kind of stats and the things that you pull in are going to be there in black and white you're going to not going to be able to banter and kind of form have you seen people sometimes in team meetings who don't really haven't really done the work and they kind of and you know took a lot of bullshit during team meetings and kind of just you know make a couple of jokes so they can get out of kind of being drilled down on what they actually did this is going to do a do away with it because the numbers are going to be there you can't lie anymore um it says here homework could discuss the benefits let's see what i have to say To stop myself getting distracted, I make sure I turn all the notifications and app icons off of my mobile phone so that I can't be interrupted. I tend to go into those applications when I'm ready to take those messages. Other things I do as well is remove the batteries from my doorbell so I'm not interrupted during conference calls and webinars. That's, inc that's insane, isn't it? Too much stuff there, man. People that... I've always, I've always wondered, like, what kind of level of self-control are you unable... Like, I know, I know, I know willpower was overrated and you have to put some kind of you have to put some proceed you have to put some processes in place in order for you to be the most effective self i know that but this idea that you have to delete apps take batteries out of doorbells and shit turn off your phone notification just so you could do your work is really really grim it shows just how fucking tethered and tied we are to our phones isn't it they sort of it's ingrained in our fucking nervous system that we have to kind of turn them off electronically right take out the batteries in order for us to be det detached from them we can't just do our work for an hour because i remember i used to do that with myself when i I'm, I'm i get fairly distracted pretty easily in the places i've worked and that's some common kind of feedback I've, I've been i've gotten from like my managers and shit but when i do the work i do the work but one thing that I did when I was in school, when I was kind of behind in my GCSEs, I needed to kind of catch up in the revision, is that I just kind of uh, built up a revision timetable that was essentially drawn out similar to my week by week schedule I had in school. So if I had, you know, science on a Monday, Monday morning for two hours, I would just revise science for two hours, right? But what I'd do is that I'd cut it into like 20 minute chunks. So I'd do 20 minutes of kind of focus study, little five minute doodle break, look out in the window, draw something, go on the internet, 20 minutes again of focus study, and just continued going on and on with that system until it got to a point where I could I could kind of hold my concentration for the allotted two hours or an hour and a half without break concentration or without getting distracted by anything. I could do that very easily. And I had a room with a Nintendo 64 in, a PS4, a mobile phone, internet. I had a room full of distractions, comic books and shit, trainers, stuff that I could always kind of get lost in. And I just be able just to kind of focus in on that and do the thing. I think that's really important because there's not going to be an occasion in life every, there's not going to be, not every occasion is going to allow you to take away all those kind of external um, distractions there's going to be occasions like it's like somebody that can't work in a busy coffee shop like what do you have to always be in a library you have to always be in a co-working space imagine if there's no room and you have to work in a coffee shop what are you going to do then or i can't work in music get to learn how to work in music learn to work how learn how to work with distractions around you that's the best way to go about things because 
especially working from home, there's going to be some times where you might want to change the scenery. It's, it's advantageous to be able to walk into anywhere, especially except for going to, I need to only go to that place because that place is quiet and no one goes there. And then suddenly you turn up there and there's a bloody big team meeting conference and it kind of throws you off kilter. So the number of home workers, I don't know, let's continue. For working from home is that you are getting out and meeting new people on a day-to-day -day basis. You can go wherever you want and work remotely. So it doesn't matter whether you're at a local um, pub or you're at a local office place. Yeah, There's yes, more mama. freedom to go wherever you need to be. Now, the downside of working from home and obviously being remote working is that having the conversation with other people. So you're not obviously in the same environment every single week. It can be very isolating, it can be very lonely, um, and you end up doing things that you don't normally do. So you could end up scrolling on social media all the time and not getting focused on the work you should be doing. I find it the opposite for myself, really. Maybe it's just me. I find that I concentrate way more at home, but maybe it's, again, it's a, it's a temperament of the person. I concentrate a lot more at home than I would do at work, and I'm prone to spend less time on my phone than I am at work. At work, I try and do everything but work for some odd reason i'm not too sure why maybe because i'm a, in the back of my head i'm expecting someone to distract me or because i feel like i could catch up on something l later on but most of my best work concentrated work has come from working from home and then once i have to go to a team meeting or do like a, a powwow in the office or whatever i can come to that meeting and it, it definitely i think you guys can attest to this if ever you've kind of worked in isolation and you have to kind of come together and sort of like present your work before you present it to the company there's a lot more energy a lot more viva a lot more ideas a lot more kind of intuition and innovative creative ideas that come to the fourth because you've been i said at home you're eager to kind of show off to your colleagues and you're eager to kind of present something so that you can take that to the office in general i think that happens more often than not i would imagine so it continues it says here what's that the charity mind has raised concerns that some home workers may feel isolated or lonely just get used to it man come on let's grow up a little bit one of the biggest things I hated about working from home was it's quite lonely um, and it's really hard to clock off whereas a co-work space you can have that work-life balance uh, and it's brilliant. Yeah, I think that's a fair um, adjustment. If you're that lonely and you really need people around you, go to a co-working space. Most co-working spaces allow you to just sit in a reception for free. Um, I'm sure that nowadays there's going to be maybe a change in that effect. There might be a, a pass that you can buy. I'm sure there'll be co-working spaces like that where you can buy like a pass that allows you to kind of sit in there for 50 quid a week or something. I don't know. There's going to be some option that's going to exist, especially if you live in areas that are nearer to your offices, right? If you're living in like the the hipster areas there's going to be probably more offices like that if you're living in areas like myself that are a bit out of the way you might have to kind of travel in but you know there's an option of course if you want to start your own little co-working space you can do so i think that would be a really cool idea um for someone to start up a little co-working space that allows people to come in have some coffees sit down socialize with people maybe have a drink at the end of the month when it's payday you get some drinks and people can have a little gather around that kind of allows a kind of monotomy to kind of be broken up a little bit i think that would be pretty cool but i think this idea that you're going to be lonely 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 is a little bit of an overstatement and again it's a side indictment in the workplace because it means that the most few people are missing is only the kind of chats that they have with people in the office but you know i think by and by it's a good option going forward and of course having a dedicated dedicated workspace is always really important as well you need that man you need that kind of separation anyway continue on a couple more before i end here ba -ba 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 -ba. oh this is funny isn't it this woman did um leadership right leadership 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 i think this is um extreme ownership this book by um joko wonek is a really good book on leadership um obviously he's got, he has a very oh, Um, so this book by Jack and Willink behind me called Extreme Ownership, he has a very particular view on leadership, obviously coming from the SEAL team. Um, they, they very much favor this idea of a hierarchy, this idea of operational command. That's how things get done. You know, being able, being in charge of, you know, a platoon of people, you have to have some kind of processes in place that allow, you know, the rule of law to kind of come from the top and it to be actioned by people at the bottom. But there's also this idea and this concept that you can also feed up some feed. You can also feed back some insights to the people at the top and they can kind of disseminate that information as they need be. But the most important thing is the people at the top, the actual leaders, they take extreme ownership. Everything that goes wrong with the company or goes right with the company is usually a, a 
reflection of the leaders you have in your in your startup or your company you work for. Every company I've been at that's been amazing has usually come from the company culture that's created by the person at the top. Every company I've been at that's kind of shitty has usually come from the frictions that exist with people at the top as well. I think we can all attest to that same sort of findings in any workplace that you've been at. And part of me thinks that this COVID thing has seen leaders been able to lock things down right lockdown has been implemented very well across the board they locked things down people stayed away from people you know locked pubs and social gathering places so you couldn't go out you stayed indoors you obeyed but then when it comes to reopening the economy or when it comes to kind of um enacting some good practices when you go out socially people are a little um, the government are a little bit shittier in that regard right they don't really take they're not taking owners ownership and they're not taking responsibility uh case in point dominic cummings you know to take going on a 260 mile round trip and having no sense of responsibility of how that looks the optics of it are really bad the fact that he set a bad precedent it doesn't necessarily register them right he are allowed to kind of ask request the public for one thing but then do the complete opposite in your own life because you, you're given that kind of lead you're given that kind of leeway because you're in charge but then you're not recognizing that you're essentially eroding the kind of collective agreement by doing that thing on your own and you're not kind of abiding by the group rules so in place of that people are having to police themselves which is really dangerous right because you get this that's where vigilantes vigilantism comes from right or being a vigilante comes from that kind of guys because if the rule of law isn't being agreed isn't being agreed upon by the collective and the people above are not enforcing it then we're going to have to somehow police ourselves that's how mafias are born that's how vigilantes are kind of birthed and what you're seeing in this video here from new york is a very much an explanation of that this incredible video somewhere in new york where um, halls of shoppers are essentially screaming at this person Person because they're refusing to wear a mask in a shopping center or in a shop in a shop somewhere i imagine part of the reasons because um most shops in the u.s have implemented this uh this uh policy that if you want to shop you have to wear a mask so there is this kind of accepted notion that in order to shop you need to have a face mask on regardless if you don't want to wear on outside in your day-to-day -day life if you want to come into a building of any sort you have to wear a face mask um and some people obviously have turned it into a political issue they've kind of seen um wearing a face mask as a as a, not wearing a face mask as a constitutional right it's against their freedoms if they want to die they can die blah 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 but it's it gets really slippery and this is the problem of not having leaders that are accountable for that take responsibility for their actions or the lead from the front is you get people then succumb to this which looks just crazy on it all counts for the person that comes into the shop without a mask on and mouths off and to the people that are kind of hounding them out in a sailor witch trial sort of fashion it's really scary Get out. Everybody in the chair at the end. Get out. I'm pretty sure the you know, it's sad to say, but I'm pretty sure in this lady's you know, in this lady's case, being that weight and having to ride on a ride on a mobility scooter, the last, you know, the last thing you should be worried about is people not wearing a mask. You probably should be concentrating on your diet and your, you know, exercise regime, of course. But it's just funny hearing her voice in the background. Like a dirty -ass kid. Dangerous place to be in, isn't it? Dangerous place to live in, man, where the public sort of like have to take responsibility of that regard. Like, oh, God almighty, what can you do? And then uh, uh, to end it, I think I might be it to end it, you know? Should I end it there or should I put one more? Um, oh, let's do one more. Jordan won neutral grays. Let's add a bit of streetwear. I think I'm going to add every podcast episode, do one element of streetwear and culture because we, I am the number one culture and streetwear podcast in the world, uh, as voted by the Streetwear and Culture National Board of Adjudicators. Okay, anyway, so this is news from Hypebeast for all you Jordan 1 fans, people that like to wear those Ease Bravado jeans, Vlone jeans, jeans with little diamond tees in it, people that like to wear um, chrome hearts stuff and all that malarkey, people that like to wear needles, flannels and you know all that stuff you're going to be happy with these shoes because those are the only people that see wearing these kind of trainers isn't it um, they've sort of like bring them back from the dead but this news from hype says the jordan one high 85 neutral gray is rumored to make a return now i remember these shoes popping up mostly during you know from the influencers online who kind of you know wear that sort of garb i'm assuming that like the ian connors the lucas sabats all those kind of people and the kids that wear those flared jeans and wear those ripped jeans the east bravado jeans i mentioned earlier they kind of made this a thing um 
which is cool to see because I remember there was an era when, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, Don C and Kanye and all those guys were kind of at the forefront to kind of wearing, you know, retro Jordans and bringing that whole thing back. And it was really uh, prided upon to have crumbly Jordans, right? So you could kind of flex, you could wear it once and be like posting a picture on Instagram, like, oh, fuck, man. I didn't know that my Jordans from 25 years ago made out this material that doesn't really age well and crumbles once it catches, once it gets a bit of humidity, crumbled, right? This is that kind of image where you kind of post a picture of your soul crumbling as you walk down the streets of Manhattan. But I like I like that. I thought that was a really cool change. But of course, you know, Jordan 1s have kind of got a whole life of their own since then. They've become the probably the most popular shoe outside of a the Yeezy and a Dr. Martins, right? They're very, very popular. They're very much uh, widely kind of heralded amongst a certain demographic of people. And they have that weird appeal. They are able to appeal to someone like myself, who's a casual sneakerhead, right? I just wear trainers that I like. They're able to appeal to the sort of like Paris Fashion Week, um, Art Basel type of influencer guy, right? That kind of, you know, drinks lean and has baggy jeans. And they also apply to the quintessential streetwear sneakerhead who has, no, the quintessential sneakerhead, night talk sneakerhead, who's of like has you know four pairs of bread jordan fours right because they they like the particular style of the 2001 the 2002 the one that came with the defining moments pack right they have all these they have the same color of the same shoe basically based on the model of the year it came out or they have doubles of the same jordan because they want to keep one on ice so that's a really effective uh, marketing uh, plan that they've kind of affected with the jordan one and i'd also add to the fact that i think part of the reason why they also might have a bit of a resurgence once they do come back out in this colorway is partly due to the last dance documentary on netflix uh focusing on jordan's um quest to win was it six championships right in a row so that might be part of it there might be you know they might be even harder to get now due to the last dance if jordan's were already hard to get previously because of all those influences online it's going to be even diff more difficult now the fact that casual consumers have seen the importance of jordan are able to put some context to it because you know it's all well and good wearing jordan brand clothing and knowing he's kind of cultural relevancy but watching that documentary you can't help but respect the guy even more and want to rep that clothing even more so right you want to like even even jordan team stuff looks a bit more appealing after watching the last dust documentary and i'm probably sure i'm not in the minority there so it's new from hypebeast it's got a picture here of one of the ogs you know og shoes just look fucking gorgeous don't they from the off from the kind of um off-white midsole to the crinkling on the collar to the big mushy soft foam tongue there exposed just absolutely gorgeous the shape look at that toe box look how flat that profile is just beautiful 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 so here's it says um news it says um highly coveted jump man fans and archive fashion crowd like i mentioned previously edward on one neutral gray is also a neutral gray is now rumored for a return after the arrival of the new beginnings pack reports are now noting that an updated version of the jordan one in the original white gray colorway is set to drop next year updated is is the crucial part what do they mean that hopefully they're going to add like fly wire to it or any kind of stupid materials just make them as they were previously because it would be cool if Jordan. I don't know why they don't do that. You know how they have like the Ada superstars '80s that are sort of like uh, distressed, and they kind of have like a bit of a faded soul, and they have a very um, you know vintage inspired last and structure to them. They're very slim, very narrow, right? Harking back to the to the actual original shoe. I wonder why they don't do a division of Jordans, especially the ones that go from like Jordan one to maybe four, where they essentially are able to make them in the same way they made them in the past. Maybe because they don't have the molds anymore i don't really agree i don't think that's a, 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 an accurate excuse you can reverse engineer stuff um, especially with the money that they have in the coffers they should be able to do something like that but a lot of time to have some sort of line that essentially is able to make uh prefabricated or pre-distressed or stuff that is directly influenced by the stuff that came out in the 80s like one for one like from the way that it looks to the height to the materials used to pick it apart and remake it and if they sold that for like 250 dollars or 300 dollars i'm sure they'd sell out i'm sure they would update materials really good leather like that'd be really cool but they don't do that they just retro the original in the in the updated materials and they're usually so hit and miss right it's like the, it's like the backboard jordan ones right they've got really good leather and then another black toe jordan one comes out and the leather's really shit there's no real continuity there's no real continuity right it's just all kind of all over the shop um so that's very that's worrying there that rumor but it says yeah if rumors are true the release will serve as the first time jordan brand has retro the two-tone mix since its debut 
um, as part of the original AJ1 lineup in 1985. The AJ1 185 neutral grey is expected to arrive with a high quality white leather upper ascended with grey panels to convey the signature 85 high top construction. Despite serving as a popular colorway in the 80s, Nike and Jordan have notably strayed away from a neutral grey in favour of a more colour based design, which obviously goes to show the kind of appetite for to consumers and also going to show how slow moving of a juggernaut nike and jordan brand are because these shoes have been about on the scene for all ages you they've, i'm sure they've probably been up on people's mood boards for time in the design studios at nike so for them to take this long to bring them out just shows how slow moving it has been um you would re, I, I would like a bit more of a reactiveness when it comes to these kind of shoes so that you're kind of tapping into the moment but again maybe the timing is perfect you know off the back of the last dances probably might be the best opportunity to really make some big 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 bucks on these um it says here despite the, the, the neutral gray but as interest in vintage styling and nike's retro has continued to grow so has the price of neutral gray sneakers aside from the og edge on 85 neutral gray fetching for almost four thousand dollars on the u.s resale market it might be because they're they're probably the last the last one before they updated the last where you can actually wear them because I haven't seen a pair of the neutral greys uh, missile kind of fall apart. Maybe it's a, it was a last shoe before they sort of updated the materials where you can kind of wear them. Because I remember I had a, a couple of Air Trainer 2 and TW2s that was similar. Where if you got the model just after the one I had, the number 2, or you got the 3, you were able to wear them day in, day out. Because um, they updated whatever polyurethane midsole they had, you know, some material component made them a bit more wearable. I'm not too sure. Or maybe it depends on who you bought them from, if they were able to kind of keep them in a cool area, blah, 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 blah. It's after they did it there. Yeah, so four thousand dollars assembly colored penetrator and penetrator GT that have also gone for normal prices. Report your price at two hundred dollars. The edge of the one eighty five is now rumored to come out sometime in twenty twenty one. So yeah, check them out. Hopefully they come out soon. Good news from the old hype beast. Anyway. That's it. Axon Zing Show episode number 318, I think. Is it 318? Probably 318. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. As ever, if you like the show, you like what you hear, please smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, why not share it with your friends? Five star review. That helps the show go a long way. But until then, thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. It's been a pleasure. Never a chore. Take care. Be safe. Bye.